David, hi. Thanks for being there. here. Really great to have you. I'm going to give you a, 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 there's so many things to say to introduce you. It's kind of an inevitable uh, concision required. It has to be haiku. So you're a professor of med not only medicine, but also of engineering at USC. And I love that about you. Uh, you're a serial entrepreneur in many, many areas. Uh, you're a very heavy duty cancer specialist, uh, have, have really a top cancer specialist. You're the medical contributor for CBS News, and you've written a number of books, including a huge bestseller, The End of Illness, and your most recent book, which also did very well, The Lucky Years. Um, but what we're going to talk about today is predominantly the pandemic because it's such an urgent problem. I'm against um, it. I took a stand early on. I'm against the pandemic. Good for you. And thank you for, for saying that, making that clear. Um, I would like to see, let's just quickly end the poll. You got 30 more, five more seconds to vote on these polling questions. Okay, I see one or two more people are voting. Oh, no, you're going. Okay, one more. Vote, vote, vote. Okay, here we're going to do it. Now, here's what the, what the audience said. Uh, I'm confident vaccines will be safe and I will be vaccinated. 76% of this group is willing to do that. Okay. Love it. Um, and uh, my current state of caution regarding COVID-19 is, okay, I tried to give a range. Um, nobody's just staying at home, but most people don't leave without a mask. And they all, what, there was something more there, but uh, keep very cautious. Um, so this group is really cautious, but um, they're still more or less going about their lives. So, okay. So David, we titled this, What We've Learned, uh, which I, I kind of was the thing you said you wanted to talk about. And there's plenty of other things that I want to ask you about. But when you summarize, what have we learned through this horrible experience thus far? So, you know, one of the great thinkers of the last century said, the only thing that will threaten man's and women's dominance on this earth is the virus. It is our wits, our brains versus their genome. And he was prescient. He was you know, accurate in many regards in that over a million years of evolution, our genome changed 1%. This virus can change 1% in a day as can any virus. And so we've had eight close calls over the last decade with viruses. Many of them have had dramatically high mortality rates, up to 80%, some of the prior ones, but they were contained or they were in small areas. This one, because of its asymptomatic spread, took us by storm and you know, was across the globe. The good is it wasn't that lethal or we would have had a pandemic like none other with crazy amounts of death. Um, the, the bad is, is obviously we've had tremendous suffering, both economic and health wise, and there will be generations of people to come that suffer. If you think about it, 80% of people who were asymptomatic with this virus had lung inflammation that may cause manifestations down the road. 20% can have heart inflammation that, again, cause manifestations down the road. So I am worried about an entire generation of people affected by this virus. But really what we've learned is we have to change what we do. Our surveillance now has to be data-driven. We have to use technology for our benefit. We have to use data, healthcare data, to actually improve quality of life and our outcomes with the things we have. And we need a global uh, uh, response together. We're in this together. The world is connected like never before. And this nationalism concept just doesn't work. So what we, you're saying, particularly for viral pandemics, we need a system for the future because this is not gonna be the last one. No question now, about it. Uh, you said to me on the phone, we've had eight near misses in the last decade. Is that possible? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you look at the SARS, the MERS, there's some other viruses, Ebola and others. Those are basically near misses um, where they burn themselves out. They were somewhere too lethal. And so, you know, when, when you get a virus like Ebola and you're remarkably symptomatic when you're infectious, it's relatively easy to stop, right? You know, when you're infectious, you stay home. Um, the problem with this one is asymptomatic spread. So if you couple asymptomatic spread and lethality, we're screwed. Mm. Um, on this one, we were lucky. We had one of the two. Hmm. What do you mean, one of the two? Yeah, right. Not lethal. Not. Oh no, but it's le both. We had both. What do you mean? Uh, well, I mean, right. But lethal was very, you know, minor in comparison to these. Some of those other viruses had an eighty percent lethality rate. 
we have oh, okay so this is lethal 2%. for too many people but by the standards of viruses it could be way 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 worse right 100 okay. percent. Mm -hmm. so tell the story about you at davos because that is just so amazing and i already wrote a little bit about it I, you know you've been involved in this pushback from such an early point i'd love you to tell us how that happened yeah, it wasn't on purpose. I mean, literally, I arrived in, in, in Davos, and a, as I walked into the convention center where we see each other every year, the Congress um, Center, yes. A, a, a scientist from China who I had known for a long time literally came and thrust his iPhone in front of my face because he was FaceTiming with a doctor um, in the Wuhan province of China. And this doctor was showing me these videos that I don't know, probably your audience is way too young, but there used to be a TV show called MASH. And, you know, when the helicopters came in, it was chaos there. And that's what it looked like. It looked like a scene from MASH, where there were people lying on the floor. There were people in cots. There were people in made-up beds, um, literally, you know, all with oxygen on and all looked like they were suffering. And I, I didn't know what was happening. From, from all I knew, there was a bomb that had gone off. And slowly they explained it to us. And then, uh, uh, you know, over the next uh, five days in Davos, we literally had meetings every day of world health leaders together saying, what are we gonna do? Is this real? How do we deal with it? And what's amazing is, you know, the world for the first time saw the sausage being made, right? We didn't know the first six weeks that this was spread in asymptomatic people. So we didn't tell people to wear a mask. We said, let's save them all for the healthcare provider because we're short on PPE. We had no idea there was asymptomatic spread. Once there was, we changed our tune. And when the public saw you know, the medical community and the health leader changing their tune, they took a step back. But, you know, Davos was really a wake up call for all of us where we came back to our countries. We all started to communicate and I started to get involved, you know, uh, uh, with some of the efforts of therapeutics, vaccines, governance globally um, to try to be able to deal with this. And, you know, amazingly, the scientific community has been sharing the United States. You know, unfortunately, we closed our labs when COVID happened. In Europe, they put cots in their labs. And most of the advances we have against this virus came from Europe, not the United States. And in many regards, you know, it's a shame. Some biotech companies or pharmaceuticals are gonna be stepped up and that's amazing. And we're certainly thankful for that. But our universities have been overall relatively silent, um, which is really, uh, 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 you know, sorry. You know, we choose university presidents who can raise capital. We don't choose university presidents who can lead us through times of trouble. What would have been different if, if we had? I mean, could we have possibly come up with a vaccine sooner? Would we have more better therapeutics? Is that all given? I mean, it, I, I'm, I'm a little, that's a point that I haven't really heard before. So I'd like you to elaborate a little bit. Um, so, I mean, you can divide it into different buckets. On the therapeutic side, you know, we let it be a free market. So basically, instead of us stepping up with leadership and saying, like in the UK, let's do one drug at a time and get it done, we have thousands of clinical trials that all competed and almost none were completed. Um, we don't have diagnostics, right? We don't know if you have immunity or not. There is no immunity test presently in the United States of America. Shocking in many regards. Obviously, testing has been an issue from day one, and there really haven't been innovations in testing. Some universities stepped up. The Broderick Harvard did an amazing job in Massachusetts, and some did well, but most didn't. Um, and we're left with you know for-profit small companies trying to take over the brunt of the testing and it hasn't been very successful um, in terms of you know developing a, a way to accelerate the vaccines you know the vaccines all came in march and remember the vaccines today are no better than the vaccines were in march we have more data but the vaccines haven't changed they haven't iterated it's not like software you write one version of a code then another version then another version we made a version and we went out with them and so as universities, we should have all stepped up and developed the assays to know what it was working sooner, to know who was getting immunity, really to be able to get fine grain looking at the data. And we didn't really do that. Um, you know, much of it was done. You know, a university that survived the plague, the university from the 1400 was the lead in the vaccines, Oxford University. You didn't see, you know, our great universities in the United States, which are clearly the most innovative and the most, you know, entrepreneurial they didn't step up there like Oxford did. Um, kind of amazing. Well, you mentioned immunity tests. That's not something that's discussed too much. We hear about antibodies. Are there immunity tests available elsewhere and we're just not getting them here? Or is that something so, that actually exists? Remember, we, when you make antibodies to a virus, they can hit any part of the virus, only the ones that bind to the spike protein and block it from coming into the ACE2 receptor and getting the virus 
can provide immunity. So if I do an antibody test and say, well, you've got a level of X, you may only be 5% uh, uh, neutralizing antibodies or the immunity antibodies. You may be zero. And so it's really hard to know what's going on. Um, and that's an issue. Most of the immune response to the virus is T cell and the assays to T cell just aren't being scaled. So at places like Oxford, they did it right. They have those immunity tests. If you'll see in, today or tomorrow, there'll be a, a, the, the data will be announced publicly on the Oxford trial. And what they did was they swabbed the nose of every single person in the trial, the entire trial. So they know that there was no asymptomatic spread of the people who got the vaccine. In the United States trials, we didn't do any of that stuff. So when you got the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine and others, all we know is that you didn't get ill. We don't know if you were able to spread the virus asymptomatically. Wow. We never did those things. And so again, to me, it's science falling short. And it, it's a wake up call here that we need to globally organize. We need to work together and figure out ways to deal with this. Cool. We need to make it so that you can open a clinical trial in a day rather than the months it normally takes. Wow. Could that have affected the, the reality that the Oxford uh, AstraZeneca uh, vaccine has a slightly lower uh, efficacy rate than the other two that they were identifying asymptomatic spread, whereas we weren't able to do that for the uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines? It's hard, to, it, it, it's hard to know, you know, 90% versus 94% if they're really different or not. Um, what we do know is that all three vaccines were 100% in terms of blocking serious infections of the virus and blocking hospitalizations. Wow. And that's really what matters in the big scheme of things. So for all of our screw ups, that is a humongous victory. I mean, and you feeling good about the vaccine situation. Damn straight. I mean, I, we have three vaccine candidates now that 100% prevented hospitalization and serious illness. And when you look at side effects, no serious vaccine related side effects other than the transitory ones associated with the vaccine early fever, chills, pain at the injection site, injection site, you know, all of which go away after a day or two. This is a major, major win for science. Wow. So even the small number of people who did get COVID taking one of those vaccines were not sick enough to have to go into the hospital. No, that's fantastic. Mild, a mild cold. Okay, uh, I wanna make sure people know that you can ask comments or questions in the chat and we will try to get to you. So uh, there's plenty of questions about COVID and the vaccines, that's for sure. Um, now, David, you're doing so many different things. I'd love you to just tell us about a few of them. For one thing, you're advising governments, um, but in particular, you're doing a really interesting project in Africa with Tony Blair. Talk about that. Pretty cool, um, if you think about it, is you know, with this vaccine, it's a two-part shot day one and day 21 or day 28. And you've got groups like Live Nation announced last week, in order to attend our concerts in 2021 and beyond, you have to have a vaccine to get in. So all of a sudden, you know, we need a way to register that. When your children got vaccinated, you basically went to your pediatrician and he or she wrote on a piece of yellow paper, a card, you know, a tetanus vaccine, you know, January, 2021. I mean, they wrote the date and that's it. So we developed a, a system to be able to schedule and to be able to distribute the vaccines in Africa, as well as register in the cloud. It's a combination of Oracle, Tony Blair, and our team. And it launched with yellow fever, which is a, a, a commonly a, 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 a disease in Africa that they're vaccinating for now. We've already done 80,000 people with this vaccine, and it's going to transition out of COVID-19. And what they get at the end of it is a digital certificate. So that can enable to go across country borders, it can enable commerce, all of the above. You have it in your own possession, so you can share it with your license or your passport, or you could just keep it to yourself. It's your own privacy. Every country has its own stripe on the server, so there's sovereignty to the data. Um, and what's amazing is in many respects, Africa leapfrogged Europe and the United States with a technology like this. Um, and I think it's really powerful. It's gonna roll out to a bunch more countries but it's relatively simple. And we should have done this a long time ago. And this has been the impetus really to kick us in the butt and do these kind of things. Well, it's great that you're so chummy with Larry Ellison, I guess, um, but also, um, <laughs> so, uh, which you are, we know that. Um, and, and all these moguls, you're, you're amazingly well connected. Um, but so in a sense, Africa is doing a beta test on the record keeping for how this ought to work across the, the, the planet in a way, right? That, that's that, that's something that could be rolled out globally. It really no will. question about it. There, there are a number of efforts to do some of that uh, globally ongoing. This is certainly one of the ones that 
There are now 44 countries lined up for this um, that we're rolling it out in. And it's certainly very encouraging that something like this and technology can be used to, to the betterment of mankind and womankind. Great, okay. Uh, Kendall, you pick who you wanna promote. I haven't been able to read all the comments uh, in, in the chat. So uh, we're gonna have a question and I don't even know who it is. Um, David's so fascinating. I have, can't read and listen at the same time. I think I'll, I'll jump in while Kendall's doing that. Okay, Josh, go ahead. So there's a question, you know, about the the groups that have been tested. I think the numbers have been, what, in the 40,000 range, I think, that Pfizer and Moderna have talked about. You know, there's one question here, because I've heard this a lot. Have vaccines been tested on pregnant subjects? Um, so, you know, talk a little about sort of the makeup of the characteristics of people who have been tested for people to feel comfortable, you know, across the, the full population. So... The way we do clinical trials in the United States and the EU is we first try it on healthier individuals, then go to elderly and other individuals and children and pregnant individuals we leave for last. Um, you know, the uh, developing fetus, obviously any perturbation can have an effect. And so we wanna make sure that there is no side effects first in adults who normally can tolerate an insult whereas a fetus can't. So there have not been tests yet on pregnant women and there have not been tests yet on young children um, and infants. And so those are being planned now. Now that we have safety data on these vaccines, we will go forward in those individuals, but they, uh, they unfortunately or fortunately come last because those are the ones that are much more vulnerable to any effect of any drug or intervention. Okay, Kendall, have you got somebody there ready to go? Uh, Drew Riani, our CDX chairman, says, what other areas may we see an acceleration of finding cures, learning more about diseases because of what the medical community has learned through the vaccine development effort of COVID? You know, when, when HIV, you mentioned HIV in your question, I see here, uh, 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 is when HIV happened in the 80s and 90s, the first outbreak, you know, what it did is the activists actually pushed the FDA, they poured blood on the steps of the FDA, and most of the cancer drugs that we have now came from that era because the FDA lowered its bar and accelerated dramatically the review of treatments for all life-threatening illnesses. The hope is here we can take something from this horrible pandemic that has affected all of our lives and something positive from it. And I think we will. There will be a liberation of data where we realize that you have the ability now to privacy protect data and also use it for public good. And I think that itself is very powerful. You also have the, the notion of doing things for public good. Both Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca Oxford said, we're not gonna make a profit in our vaccine. And their vaccine is two to $3 a dose. You have Moderna and you have Pfizer whose prices are 30 to $40 a dose um, and are making prices of it. And you see both of their CEOs shelling significant numbers of shares on all positive news. And so I think there's going to be a notion of doing things for public good. There's gonna be use of data and we're all going to be willing again, in a privacy protected way to have our data help others. And I think that itself are two very powerful things that will come out of this. Okay, I think Esther is here ready to ask a question. Am I right? Yeah, just- um, Esther Dyson, sometimes it's identify yourself, Esther, just for anybody. Who... Esther Dyson. Hi, Esther. Hi, Hi Esther. by the way, thank you for your help a few years ago. Um, the question I had is about the Commons Project and Common Pass. I don't know if it's actually what you were referring to. We are working with Apple. It's international, initially US-based to do exactly that, give you sort of a, a privacy protected passport recording either a test initially or a vaccine. Yeah, so I mean, common pass is a way to get the digital ID or digital immunity. What we're talking about is a much more comprehensive system that registers your vaccines, yeah transmits the, I mean, uh, transports the vaccine, supply yeah. to management all in one, and we can tie into Common Pass or any other means. Okay, I'll write to you because we would love to work with you precisely. We're the digital side. We don't do vaccinations and we we're looking for partners that do precisely what you're talking about. So you're I'll talking in about in the Wellville areas, Esther? No, no, no. I'm talking about worldwide. The, the worldwide. initial use case is airlines because that's that's not coercive. It's very simple. You know, it's not like you do this or you can't have a job. It's okay. If you want to travel on my airplane and sit next to all these other people, we would like you to show evidence 
that you have, in this case, taken a test or in the future being vaccinated. Yeah, the and airlines have a cooperative group that they're working with World Economic yes. Forum on a, a yeah, platform for us. this, which is great. That's great. Right. Right. And we'd love to talk with you about the other stuff. Sure. And we will do this separately, not not through Please David's do. wonderful conference. Not in thank front you, of the David. world. Talk yes. to you soon. I, sure. I hope. Thank you, Esther. I hope it happens. Uh, I want to just quickly. There's, we have more audience questions, but you know, at our last conference, uh, Zeke Emanuel was speaking about some of this stuff. Although his main presentation was on another topic, but he was very concerned about the supply chain issues. And I noticed yesterday, the New York Times had a big thing about Corning's plant in upstate New York, creating these super high tech vials that don't you know, get glass dust in the, in the vials. And, but and they make a million a day, whoopee doo. Well, you know, are we gonna have enough vials? Are we gonna have all the equipment we need? Are you confident about that stuff? So it's really interesting, you know, vials are a major issue. You know, the problem is historically vaccines are placed in a unit dose vial. Every dose is one vial. Well, that means in the United States, you'd need 700 million vials because it's two doses per person, which is kind of crazy. So given that we're going to vaccinate everybody in a short period, why not make 10 dose vials, 20 dose vials, 100 dose vials? Believe it or not, you know, there's a lot of regulations in that regard. So much of the supply chain has to do with getting rid of regulations that hold us back on progress. Um, as well as working with the supply chain side. You had uh, a Pfizer who said, we're going to do a trial ourselves, a clinical trial. We're not going to use the government. We're going to do our distribution ourselves with a pretty good distribution partner called Federal Express. Um, and uh, uh, we're going to make our own boxes through innovation that can keep our vaccine at minus 94 degrees Fahrenheit, which it needs to be kept. And you put a thousand uh, vials in it, a thousand doses of vaccine. You could ship the whole box with its own power supply. So for a week, it could be stored and then it could be you know, 24 hours at refrigerated temperature to administer to people. So I think we're seeing some innovation there. Uh, you know, I am worried that it's not equally distributed across the country. For example, we did, we were thought early on hospitals be a great place to administer vaccines. Well, all of a sudden, the numbers of cases in the United States went through the roof and hospital occupancy went up. So we don't have empty parking lots for people to go through hospitals now and get vaccinated because they're full. <laughs> so you have to transition from hospitals to other places for those vaccines which is not an easy task when you're talking about the whole country. Okay, David, you have admirably or surprisingly not cast too many aspersions on our national planning process during this, this year. But I would assume that if we'd had a more methodical national planning process, something like the 10 dose vials would have possibly emerged from that. How do you yeah, feel about that? I think the biggest issue in our national planning process is we left too much up to the states. You know, today at five o'clock Eastern time, we'll announce or the uh, CDC will announce who they think the priority should be. And then the states can do whatever they want with that information. That's crazy. Every state can do whatever they want with their testing information, format it however they want and send it in in a piece of paper or a fax. There are no standards for data. You see testing out there. This is 98 percent sensitive. Well, they chose people with the highest viral loads. And of course, it's 98% sensitive in them, but it's not representative of who has the virus. I can go case by case. And because there hasn't been any leadership there at the federal level, we're in a lot of trouble here. During a pandemic, you cannot let the free market do its own. You have to control it. And you have to be in charge on this health side, especially on the supply chain. And yes, there have been a lot of, a lot of areas lacking there that we could have done much, much better on. Wow. Okay. I am going to... Uh, I, I don't see him. Could you can you promote Clayton Kendall? He had a question, right? Hi, I, I don't think he is promoted, but I think he's just ready for the next session. Unless oh, okay, he would All like right. to comment. <laughs> okay, I'm getting very confused. Clearly, uh, sorry. But wait, Jim Doherty, what are you going to say? Do you want to talk this? about your confusion? Is it been uh, ongoing no, for yeah, a long time? I, David? I didn't get enough yoga before this. That's why I did. <laughs> um, but. Oh, you know, something I wanted you to talk about, you know, you were very upset on the phone about how much money we've wasted. You, you touched on this a little bit, I think, in the university comment. But why do you think we've wasted, you said, I think, hundreds of billions of dollars in the process? We, we Maybe that was, I misheard you, but certainly you were talking about wasting billions. Uh, explain. I you know, we've done a lot of things inappropriately. We let every company on its own say, hey, I have a drug for COVID-19. Their stock price went up dramatically. And then their, their executives could sell their shares, even though, you know, most of them, I would tell you, there's no chance it will have any effect at all. So we really let the free market ride with drug development, 
with therapeutic development, we now have 196 vaccine candidates in development. And if you think about it, each one of them had to make a contract for manufacturing, for vials, for distribution. I will tell you that at most six of them will work. And so if we had real leadership in this regard, we could have said, hey, listen, the other you know, 190, get the hell out of here. We're gonna use your supply chain, your vials, your whatever, for the ones that we think have the most likelihood of working. That's leadership in a pandemic. And we didn't have that here. And that's what I was referring to, is that you have so many efforts that are basically wasting resources on our supply chain, our manufacturing chains and others that shouldn't be because we just let it be a free market. Are, are you like so many people uh, predicting that because of Thanksgiving, we're gonna have a vast new surge in the very near future? Or do you think that might not happen? I'm not predicting, I'm telling you. I mean, we will. I mean. Every other holiday, we've had at least a 50% surge. I mean, this holiday is no different. And when we, remember, this virus spreads exponentially. And when you go in with record numbers of cases um, and you, know, you have the travel that we were able to see by TSA and others, um, we are going to have spread. So when you start with a higher number, you end up with a dramatically higher number because there are more people to spread the virus. There is no question we are going to have an increase over the next 10 to 14 days. No, oh, that's a shame. Um well, this has been great, David. Uh, what haven't I asked you about that we should have talked about? What do you think people don't understand about this pandemic that we haven't touched on that they need to understand? Well, on the vaccines, what people don't understand is that in every vaccine I know for the last six decades, the side effects we saw happened in the first several weeks. We haven't seen long-term side effects from vaccines. So the notion that we rush things here just isn't right. Um, the numbers of cases that we saw in these vaccine trials were actually larger than most of the vaccine trials over the last several decades. So the vaccines are safe. There is no question about it. And uh, th that part I'm comfortable with. And I'm you know, more than happy about the efficacy. It's above where I and I think everybody else thought we would be. Um, the notion of wearing a mask being politicized you know, just makes no sense to me. You know, to get normative behavior change, you need leadership. And we all have to step in that leadership. And what didn't happen here is most CEOs didn't step up as leaders. Most mayors, governors did not step up as leaders. And so it's not just at the federal level. It really has to be every level. If you're the head of a household, you need to step up and be a leader here and show behavior that makes sense. Um, and we're not doing that now. And we're still not doing that now. Every CEO should be talking to the people at their company and their families, really pushing them to do the right thing. Your healthcare costs are gonna go up dramatically over the next several decades if you don't. Every case of virus now can have ramifications, heart disease, cancer, and others down the road because of the inflammation associated with that virus. So they need to step up um, and it just hasn't happened now. And you know, a lot of people just step back. They stayed at home. They, you know, they didn't get aggressive. And this is something we should all be working on together. So to, in, in just to maybe to wrap, in order for us to understand what the right thing is, describe how you move around in the world right now, and you know, indoors and outdoors, and what you do and don't do. So I, I am in clinic now seeing patients. So I have a full load of patients. When patients come in, they stand in front, of, they, they, they have a mask. If they don't have a mask, our parking attendant hands them a mask through their window. They stand in front of an iPad that measures their temperature without touch. They come in with that mask, they enter directly into a room, and then we proceed with examining them and everything, where again, we're socially distanced for 95% of it, as long as we're not touching them. We are all wearing a mask and then they leave and everything is done with no touch. Um, uh, uh, you know, I go home and we either uh, uh, order from local restaurants where we cook ourselves, we don't go out. To, I have not been out to a restaurant, although I support all the local ones as much as possible, but I don't go out to a restaurant since February. Um, you know, we have our bubble of our children and that's about it. And I have my bubble here at work and that's about it. We use color.com, which is a cancer genetic testing company that transitions to COVID-19 to test every employee in our center several times a week. And so they self swab and we mail the swabs in the next day we get the results. Um, and I've got a very contained, boring life at the present time. I have a TV studio in my house. So this morning I did the morning show. So I'm up at 3 a.m. and at 4 a.m. on I'm on air in my you know, house and I can uh, go about my day. And so we've been able to really change it. So I'm productive. Our labs here have people working in our labs. I'm like, I can't stop cancer research. I can't stop COVID research. 
or we're in trouble and every patient will lose time and that's not going to happen. We have to see full loads of schedules and administer drugs. We have to do it. Um, and so when I look at my staff who are risking their life every day in many respects, um, you know, that's why health, you know, people on the front line need to get the vaccine first because they're risking their life to help others and they're risking their families' lives. So they have to go home to their families. I remember in the beginning of this where we didn't have PPE, we didn't know what was going on. I would go in to see patients and I'd walk by the cars in the doctor's parking lot and I saw a dozen or more people sleeping in their cars because they had grandma living at their house. They had a child who had diabetes and they didn't wanna go home. And it was one of the saddest things I've seen in medicine is this is how far we've made in progress where the doctors are sleeping and the nurses are sleeping in their cars because they didn't want to go home. Wow. Well, thank you for doing everything you're doing. Thank you for joining us. Go back to your patients and I hope you will come back and tell us more about how much we learned in this period after it's over. So thank you we very much, it. David. Really thank good. Thank you stuff. all. Thanks, David. Thank you.